Aloha. Welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm Dan Leith, and I go by Fig, as I hope you know. Uh, the, the concept of the power of imagination is to share somebody's figment and entertain you. We usually do that and inspire you to chase your own dreams. And it's kind of like a most interesting person in the world search. And if you go back and look at our YouTube playlist or the playlist on Think Tech Hawaii's website, you're going to find some very interesting folks. And I've got one today, I promise. I'd like to introduce Captain, U.S. Navy retired, Carlton Kramer. Carlton, aloha, brother. Aloha and yakwe. Good to see you, Fig. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Carlton's current job is as the Dean of the College of Security Studies at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. If you don't know anything about it, Google it and tune in for a later episode of The Power of Imagination, where I hope to have Admiral Pete Dumatauta, the current director, talking about how many things he's fix fixed from my time as director in a place that does amazing work. But uh, Carlton, we're not talking about DKI APCSS today. We're talking about your very interesting life. Um, do you think of it that way? Do you look back and go, well, that was interesting? Well, I know it was different. I know it was different. And yeah, in, in hindsight, very interesting. And still, well, I'd say, yeah, it started differently than from your average naval officer um, because you grew up in a different environment in the Pacific, right? I did. I did. I grew up in the Marshall Islands. And if you drew a straight line between Australia and Hawaii, it's about halfway. And when mm -hmm. I uh, first moved to the Marshall Islands, it was still a trust territory of the United Nations. It had not yet gained independence. How about that? Why were you there? Did you just do, were you shipwrecked? Were you a long Gilgans Island sort of a thing? What's the deal? Here? Well, my father was with MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he was involved in the atomic testing that the United States conducted in the Pacific uh, in the late 50s. And as a result of his work with MIT and in that program, we ended up going out to the Marshall Islands. And you spent most of your time there, kind of a son of a, the sea thing here. We got a picture of you as a with some navigation device that sailors used. I used a GPS and inertial nav system as a fighter pilot, but what are you doing there? Well, that is a, <laughs> boy, that picture brings back memories. 1971, we are on a 41 foot sailboat and we are transiting from Taiwan to Guam. And I was the navigator. I was 12 years old. Wow. And I used a plax, plastic sextant, uh, a stopwatch, and an almanac. And uh, right. that's me taking a, a sun sight uh, during the day. And you apparently got to your destination, so good job. <laughs> well, we, um, we felt lucky, and this is going to sound strange, but we felt lucky if our, uh, if our triangulation was six to eight miles uh, really? accurate. We, we felt pretty good if we got that. When you're on a sailboat on the open ocean, bouncing up and down, it's really hard to get much more accurate than that. So it seems to me you have to pick a destination island that's at least eight miles across so that you <laughs> are within the, the cone of confusion, or maybe allow a little less to, because you'll see it visually. But did you ever get lost at sea? I mean, were you really saying, where the heck am I? Um. I think the honest answer is no. Uh, we generally knew where we were, but again, um, when we thought we were within a day and a half or two days of landfall, we posted a watch because uh. we weren't actually sure when landfall would be. So um, we were cautious in that regard. Because it's not just uh, distance and direction, it's the time and uh... Yeah, I can imagine it's pretty complex stuff. But you did, you also spent quite a bit of your youth in Hawaii. I think ninth and eleventh grades, you told me, and Hawaii is home now. But but you had some roots here earlier. That's true, and and the uh, the connection was sort of twofold. When I was living in the Marshall Islands, uh, whenever we got off uh, our island, we came to Hawaii. We came to Oahu. And so I was in and out of Hawaii in the early 60s for a long time, sort of as a, as a tourist. 
And then um, a little bit later on, I did go to school here. You're right. Uh, it was ninth grade uh, and 11th grade. And I almost graduated from high school. Not quite, but I almost made it. Hmm. And then a little How's later on in life, I came back uh, and, and worked for a bit uh, in Hawaii as well. You Did you enter university early or how did you almost graduate from high high school my my experience was i barely graduated from high school so how does one almost graduate from high school i i actually flew from the marshall islands to california on my 18th birthday and mm -hmm. i was going to be a wild and crazy young man uh couldn't get a job uh, or didn't try very hard so i ended up in school i i did a uh two quarters at cal poly which is a, a technical school um, did well with the grades. So I went to UC Santa Barbara, made an appointment with the chancellor. I, I wanted to uh, enroll at UC Santa Barbara. They asked me for my SATs. I said, what's an SAT? <laughs> yeah. um, but when I told him my story, he just looked at me and he said, okay, you're in. And so that, that's how I got into university. Well, that's, yeah, again, we have different experience because they asked for my SATs and they said, no, 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 no. this number is too small. This no, must be another test. I said, <laughs> No, that, that is the number. So you attended university and what did you major in? What, what was your undergraduate degree in? I, I majored in political science and history and with a minor in economics. Cool. And um, I found at the end of that experience, I wasn't particularly employable. So I decided to continue my schooling and, and I went to law school. Well, here our paths converged because I was a political science major as well, and um, it was good enough to get into pilot training, but I wouldn't run for office. So it was good enough for you to get into law school. Were you drawn to the law for a long time before this, or was this, was that a figment, too, to be a lawyer? Um. I, I actually, as I as I got done with my university schooling, and was looking around, um, my observation was that a law degree uh, in and of itself was kind of cool, but it also, from my perspective, uh, opened options and gave me options. And so part of the rationale for going to law school was I, I thought it would open up avenues for me of some kind. I didn't know what they were, but it seemed to me that that was a, a good ticket to have. And so off I went to law school. So if as, as a first year uh, law student, if somebody said, what kind of a lawyer are you going to be? Would it have been at that point a Navy JAG, which you did become? But was it was that already in your mind or did that take a while to develop? It, it took a while to develop. At the time, I would have told you business, corporate lawyer of some kind. Uh, you know, they have to wear suits, right? That would have. <laughs> been a deal breaker for me, man. So I, I had vague notions of being in the business world, being a high powered lawyer, uh, but those those notions faded. Um, and and I went into the uh, the Navy JAG Corps. Uh, and was that a snap decision? Did you I mean, and why the Navy? Because you're a child of the sea? It, it was not a snap decision. Um, I entered the uh, the reserves in law school. And so I mm -hmm. did have a connection to the Navy, but the program I was in gave me a lot of flexibility. I could basically do what I wanted to do. And, and what uh, happened in my case is I graduated from law school. I was very fortunate to secure a clerkship at the Supreme Court of Hawaii. And so wow. that brought me back to Hawaii for a year, writing uh, law and researching uh, for, at the time, Justice Nakamura. Um, it was a phenomenal experience. It sounds uh, incredible for a young intern. Wow. It, it was, but I have to admit, I, I was a little bit antsy uh, after a year of, of writing and researching. And basically, I went active uh, with my Navy connection. I was in the reserves okay. and I decided. So you were in the out. reserves doing part time. Navy stuff, and then you transitioned to full time active duty Navy JAG before they were glamorized in movies and on TV. So, um, 
that that had to be a big step to go full time and you're expecting exciting stuff. But I know from my experience in the Air Force with some of the great uh, attorneys who worked for me that you kind of go through a, a probation period, not really, but where you do relatively mundane stuff, prosecution, defense. Did you do the, all that, all those kind of bones making jobs as a new Navy JAG? The, the short answer is yes. You, you know your JAG Corps. Uh, you go in, you're a litigator, and you're a litigator on both sides. You do mm -hmm. it for the prosecution, you do it for the defense. You spend time uh, working with sailors on what I would call broadly family law issues, taking right. care of, uh, of our Doing wills, of our helping with divorce advice, all the, all the stuff. And you know, those for our civilian viewers, the UCMJ is really a very robust legal construct. And uh, it's not the same as civil law, but the protections are pretty good. And a, and a defense attorney, a JAG or any of the, in any of the services, really is obligated to provide the best defense possible free of command influence. And I think by and large they do. Would you agree? I, I would, uh, absolutely. Um, but after you do your initial years uh, in mm -hmm. the courtroom and, and working uh, for the service members, um, you then branch out into what we call the staff judge advocate world. And this is where you're advising commanders. In my case, uh, it was shore duty first, uh, followed by sea duty. Um, and uh, that, that opens up a whole new world of what we might call operational law. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. This is, the, we just showed a picture of young Carlton Kramer looking very sharp, Mr. <laughs> and and uh, working with troops, uh, we've got another picture of a sailor who's asked you to administer the oath of office uh, on his enlistment. And um, there is a close connection between our JAGs and the troops in those early jobs, right? There absolutely is. And, uh, you know, I think the average bear probably doesn't want an encounter with a lawyer. But I'll tell you, uh, the Navy JAGs, in terms of what they do, taking care of the men and women uh, in the Navy, they, they do a lot. Uh, and it's very rewarding. And I, I think it, it helps uh, quite a bit. And so you did all that, and now you get to what we've called operational law. And uh, in that case, you're really the attorney for commanders who are making operational decisions. And you did that in uh, surface units uh, aboard ship and then ashore with aviation units, I think, right? That, that, that is right. In my case- <laughs> I did my homework. In my case, uh, I was advising a commander of a large installation mm -hmm. and uh, after that tour, I then was assigned to an aircraft carrier, and I was the lawyer for the commanding officer uh, of an aircraft carrier, in my case, USS Saratoga. Mm -hmm. And then um, after the aircraft carrier, uh, moved on to different uh, uh, operational jobs as well. And, and let me say that any commander who wants to stay a commander um, Keeps his keeps his jag as a trusted confidant and gets advice. The, the lawyers don't make the decisions, but there has to be a legal basis for them for command decisions, and that takes um, that takes a good relationship between the commander and attorney. That's in peacetime. That can be about punishing a, a soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or about some decision you're going to make. But in operational law, the rubber really hits the road when you're talking about in conflict, when you're advising commanders what they can, can't, should, shouldn't do in a combat environment, um, right? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. Uh, the stakes are different and, and in some respects higher when you get into the, the conflict or the kinetic uh, environment. Um, you can't make mistakes or you yeah, should our, not make mistakes. I've spent a lot of time talking about the need for strong moral underpin, underpinnings in engaging in combat operations. Our moral underpinnings come from the legal construct that we operate under. And you know, as, as somebody who's commanded in combat, I, I just can't overstate the importance of the advice that 
uh, Carlton wound up giving to people like Edmund Woolley Moore, who I think we have a picture of you with Edmund Moore. He's, he's one of my favorite uh, Navy guys here. There you are getting some sort of a, is that an Article 15 or other punishment you're getting from him or something good? <laughs> It was one of those rare moments where uh, where there was a public acknowledgement that the lawyer was uh, was helpful on occasion. Wow! Um, no, the context I, for I'm that, kidding, uh, of course. Go the, ahead. The context for that picture: I had spent a couple of years uh, as the fleet judge advocate for Fifth Fleet uh, mm -hmm. Persian Gulf, and at that time frame, we were enforcing the oil embargo uh, against Iraq. There were 18 countries mm -hmm. out there. Uh, and in many respects, uh, Fifth Fleet and myself as the lawyer sort of served as the, not sort of, we did serve as the coordinating agent for that uh, UN uh, authorized uh, embargo. And having done the no-fly zone enforcement under UN Security Council resolutions, very complex, add in international partners, and you're talking about some high-end law, right? Absolutely. Um, I, I was able to participate on Southern Watch, um, mm -hmm. and it was hard. It was very hard because the bottom line is we were essentially engaged in combat, although we didn't call it that. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, steel on target, and everything had to be very carefully uh, done and properly done. Yeah, and it does. And I'm going to take a quick break here, Carlton. Well, you catch your breath, and I plug my next figments on reality on uh, the 27th. I'm going to talk about national security collateral damage from my experience there. And this is very germane to our discussion thus far about operational law. The It turns out that the drone strike touted to have taken out uh, perpetrators of the uh, attacks that sadly killed 13 Americans and uh, scores of Afghans uh, was a misplaced hit and killed a family of 10 or 10 civilians in Afghanistan. So far, we've gotten what I'd term a tepid apology out of the, the military leaders. And I'm going to contrast it with an approach I took in an equally tragic collateral damage where I was the commander of the forces that, that um, dropped bombs that as it turned out, killed civilians. We've got to do better. We need a full uh, accounting, and we owe that to not just the American public, but the world public. So please tune in, Figments on Reality, next week, Monday, 10, 10 a.m., 10 a.m., Y Standard Time. Okay, so now you get into the special ops world, Carlton. And folks, this is what you've been waiting for. This is where we acknowledge that Carlton Kramer has repeatedly verified the existence of gravity. And the reason you did that, you've done now um, surface units, uh, an aircraft carrier, a surface, but command with aviation and maritime responsibilities. Now you're tapped to go into the special operations world. What, what were the first things you thought about when you got orders to the soft side, the special operations forces side? Um, admittedly, it, it, it was exciting, but it was intimidating. Uh, I was going to a special part of the Navy, um, the SEAL community, the Naval Special Warfare community. And I knew that I was competent as an attorney. I was confident in my abilities, but I knew that I would be doing a lot of non-attorney stuff and I would be mm -hmm. in a lot of different environments that I wasn't used to. So it occurred to me, I should get ready. And how did you set out to get ready? What did you do? Um, well, I, I had always been um, working out uh, and running, and, and I increased that back at that point in my life. Hey, you were in into martial arts when you are young. I didn't show the picture. We can show it now, right? So, you know, you can hang around with these dudes. <laughs> this is karate. Very nice. Very nice. But I mean, so you had some of the ingredients already. Some of the ingredients. So what I did is I, I thought to myself, what would be helpful? And it occurred to me that I should know how to repel out of a helicopter. I should know how to do sling load operations. Repel and being going sliding down a rope from a hovering helicopter. If anybody doesn't know that, but very cool. That's cool stuff. 
Yes. So I, um, I, I found myself at air assault school, uh, getting ready for my assignment to the Navy special warfare community. And at the same time, it occurred to me that I should know how to jump out of an airplane. I thought it would be a very awkward moment if I showed up in the SEAL community and they asked me to jump out of an airplane and I said, I don't know how. So I set yeah, off I, to learn. It, you know, as a fighter pilot, uh, I always said I'd only jump out of, a per, uh, of an airplane if it were on fire. And I was in a couple of airplanes that were on fire and I still didn't jump out. So, you know, there's, there's just something about leaving the comfort if such as it is, and safety of an airplane, you had never done any skydiving at all at this point. You're just going to go to jump school. That's that's the whole of it. Uh, I had never done it before, and quite frankly, um, I was a bit terrified. Uh, jumping out of an airplane <laughs> is not a natural act; it's an unnatural. A bit act. terrified. Yeah, I'm not sure those two words go together particularly well. Um, so, uh, I think you went to Benning probably, right? Do they do all of the, and, and that's five static line jumps where you don't even have to pull the report. That's right. right? That's right. Okay. And then you started free falling, free falling. Sounds like a song because it is a song. How different was it to go out the door for the first time without the static line? Did it, did that matter to you? Did, did it feel different? Um, it, it was exhilarating. Uh, a, a static line. By this jump. time, you're not even a bit terrified. <laughs> well, I, I got to admit, uh, even on the first couple of free falls, I uh, I was scared. I mean, the short, long, yeah. short of it, I was. But uh, in very quick order, quick fashion, uh, two things happened. Um, I got good at it, but that okay. wasn't so hard because gravity does ninety percent of the work. Um, and I found uh, it was, quite frankly, an adrenaline rush for me. I loved it. Uh, and so I started doing more and more. You loved it a lot. Now, we talked earlier, and the first time I heard years ago when we worked together at APCSS, how many jumps you had. Frankly, I didn't believe you, but I didn't believe a lot of things he said, so I just scoffed, scoffed at that. But I've come to believe this. An average military parachute is somebody who's on jump orders a uh, reasonable amount of time probably going to get what 60 70 free fall jumps in their career yeah I, I think that's that's a pretty accurate number figuring you know they jump for pay they jump for mission um, over time you have to stay current if you will just like in flying and how many free fall jumps do you have captain retired carlton kramer I have 1,200 free fall jumps. Unbelievable, folks, 1,200 times. When 60 to 70 is the norm, 1,200, that is unbelievable. You must have been hooked hard. I was, I was, I was an adrenaline junkie. I plead guilty. And, and you jumped some as civilian as a, uh, as a tandem jump master where you strap somebody to your, to your gear and they have the experience without the responsibility, I guess. I mean, they're part of the, they're dead weight is what they are, hopefully dead as a figure of speech. Um, I did that once at the Air Force Academy when I was at Air Force Space Command. I loved it. Uh, did all of your tandem passengers love it? Or did you have any who freaked out once they were out the door? Um, I have, oh gosh several hundred tandem jumps where I, I strapped a person to me and took them out on a yep. jump. I think uh, there's only one person who didn't enjoy it. And that was on a landing, that person broke their ankle. But I think the other several hundred uh, just loved it. Um, some people get seasick on a free oh, really? jump. Isn't that, that's probably all the detail we need. Yes, sir. I, could, and I, had a I couldn't of stop laughing. My, my experience was it, it was so cool. I couldn't stop laughing. And, you know, someday I thought I might do it again. But but it isn't all fun and games. So in your jump career, you've had four real close calls. Um, actually, three, sir. I, I've had okay, three. three. Um, statistically, what happens when you're jumping, and I, I jump these these rectangular uh, shaped parachutes, they're called ram air parachutes. 
Mm -hmm. um, on average, every 350 jumps or so, you're going to have a malfunction, even if you do everything right. And so over the course of my jumping career, I had three instances where things went horribly wrong. Um, please share, please share. The audience, I can tell, I feel it through the, the internet, is dying to know about these three yikes moments. Um, okay, from, from least exciting to most terrifying, um, the, the first malfunction occurred when I was actually carrying a passenger. And uh, we were uh, in free fall, we deployed our main parachute, and we had a malfunction. And I determined I had to cut away the main parachute and go back into free fall, pick up some speed, and then uh, deploy the reserve. And I was ah. able to do that. And uh, uh, the good news is the passenger never knew, just never knew what happened. But that was a, a difficult situation because we were a little bit low and yep. moving a little bit fast. And, and you've got to pick up airspeed to make sure the reserve deploys properly. I assume I'm thinking thinking through this. Th that's exactly right. You you want a little bit of uh, velocity there so your reserve will will inflate quickly. Okay. Yikes! Number two. What was that? Yikes! Number two was uh, a big mistake on my part. I uh, had a, a nice free fall, a wonderful jump. I was having so much fun that I lost track of altitude yep. and I was really wow. quite low and uh, basically ended up uh, deploying my parachute and um, landing comfortably, but it was a matter of seconds where it would have been a different story. Wow. Number three must be something then if that's. Number three, number three. Uh, that, that takes the brass ring, if you will. Okay. Um, I, I actually jumped out of a military aircraft and to provide some perspective, uh, when we do free fall, we want to be at several thousand feet when we start the free fall uh, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, we went out at 950 feet, a little under a thousand feet. On, on purpose though, just as a something you might do in a surprise insertion, right? We did it on purpose. We made the assessment that we could we could do it. And the key was when you came off the ramp of the aircraft, you needed a perfect exit and a perfect main parachute uh, in order to to uh, uh, successfully uh, parachute at that low okay. altitude. And I came off the ramp and had the worst malfunction of my life. I had what's called a ball of trash above me. <laughs> oh man. I, um, I cut it away, deployed the reserve, and as my reserve popped open, I impacted the ground. Hard. Hard. So after all this, it's so hard that you shattered one of your legs, right? And this one, this was the one I think. Actually, sir, that was another incident. <laughs> okay, so four. You're right. So, four. so we don't have time to go into the four, the fourth one where you broke the ever living daylights out of your legs. But clearly, at some point, you quit jumping because of all these mishaps. I, I did. I, uh, I, right. I, I well, not exactly. I, I jumped for a couple of decades. I loved it, um, but I ended up um, making a decision between uh, kids and parachuting. Yeah, here, have a dad. Here, here's your kids. They're wonderful kids. They're just characters. Wonderful. Uh, characters to be around. Would you ever jump again, or is that in your past? I I think I would. I think I would. Maybe when the kids are all grown up, yeah. uh, and they're no longer kids, uh, I may take. And when they can, at it. and when they can jump with you, we are almost out of time, uh, Carlton. I really appreciate your story. I look forward to hearing more when I get down to visit APCSS. Um, but what's your current figment? I have to ask every guest. You know, surely you have a something a dream that that you're eager to execute and live um what what's garth and kramer's current figment i i think it would be to travel and and the reason that is i spent my whole life traveling um Good. i was in the marshals uh, my formative years i was traveling i spent 28 years in the navy traveling and with apcss oh. 
I've been traveling. Well, yeah, I know I'm that, 36 countries in five years. So we only have time to ask you, what's the first place you're going when you start traveling again? Ooh, I'd love to go to uh, Dubai, uh, Dubai, one of my favorite cities. Even though you've been there many times before. I love it. it it's a great okay, city. Well, we, we don't have time for people for you to tell people why, so they'll have to Google and see what you loved about Dubai. Hey, uh, Carlton, I really appreciate your time. You are one of the more interesting Navy Jags I've ever known and have had an interesting life. And I am happy that the three, oh no, four near misses were only near misses. So thanks for joining me on Figments, the Power of Imagination. And uh, I bid you aloha as I wrap up another episode. Folks, thanks for tuning in to Figments, the Power of Imagination, where we try to uh, inspire and entertain you. I think uh, Carlton Kramer did both today and join me on Figments on Reality. Uh, a special thanks, as always, I can't say it enough to the folks at ThinkTech uh, who facilitate not just me, but some 20 or 30 other civilian journalists day in and day out. Go to their website, find something to watch, but also find a way to donate because it's a true nonprofit and they enable a lot of content sharing from committed civilians who are trying to make the world better. So I'll see you next time on Figments on Reality and Figments, the Power of Imagination. Aloha.